Buenos dias a todos y todas. Good morning or afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And special thank you to Fundación Descubreme and our fantastic team for hosting us. You have again managed to set up a very exciting and promising conference. Um, I this session will be in English. Um, I do understand Spanish, but I have not been practicing it since 20 years. So if you allow me, uh, we will be presenting in English. My name is Loïc Van Kutsem, and I work for Ashoka and uh, feel extremely honored to be chairing this session today on scaling impact. In this session, we will be discussing what scaling means, why does it matter? Which scaling approaches exist? Which types of roles and partners are needed? Challenges, success factors, and which role you could play in this ecosystem? 
I see in the chat that we're, I think, still waiting for Spanish interpretation. I just might need someone here from the organization to tell me if I can continue or if we should be waiting for this. Okay, great. Uh, I will continue. Uh, it seems it is working. Um, so, as you know, you are muted and unable to speak, but we highly encourage you to interact, share your ideas, your experience, and ask questions using the chat function. Let's make it as lively as possible. Um, I believe you can choose the audio source from the world button and activate Spanish subtitles from the closed captioning CC button. International Sign Language is also available and I encourage you to perhaps pin the sign language interpreter to make sure you can visualize him or her all the time. For those who cannot see me, I'm a white male in the mid 40s. I am wearing a beige shirt. I have a beard and grayish hair. And I am dialing in today from Belgium. I am also very excited to share this virtual stage with Valborga Fröhlich, a friend, an Ashoka Fellow, and the CEO of Atempo Group, a social enterprise based in Austria, which develops and distributes services and products that make life easier for people with and without disability in many different ways, as you will discover a bit later. Welcome, Valboga. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Welcome. And thank you for the invitation to be thank here you. now in this great event. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to have you with us, Valboga. Before we dive into the content of, of today's session, uh, allow me a couple quick words on Ashoka the organization I work for. Um, we are um, the lead leading global network of social entrepreneurs and change makers. So people who solve societal problems with innovative and systemic solutions. We select, connect and provide support to over 4,000 of these social entrepreneurs and young change makers in 90 countries all over the world, including in several countries in Latin America and in Chile. Our goal is to help these change makers to scale their impact and to change systems for the better. Our vision is a world where everyone is a change maker. We believe that having the tools and the opportunities to create change is a human right and should be accessible to all. With several colleagues all over the world, I co-lead a program called Impact Transfer. We support the replication and the transfer of proven social innovations in new geographies where they are needed and supported by local stakeholders. So it's all about replicating what works rather than reinventing the wheel. In this context, I have the immense privilege of leading our impact transfer program with Zero Project, ESO Foundation and Fundación Descubreme since four years. Uh, with the, their incredible support and the support of many other partners all over the world, we help each year 10 innovations in clarifying the replication strategy and connecting with replication partners all over the world. Perhaps partners like yourselves who can help to adapt and adopt these proven solutions in your local context. So each year we support these 10 selected projects through trainings, individual mentoring, matchmaking with partners, and we give them visibility during the Zero Project conferences in Vienna and in Latin America. 41 projects have already participated in our program and 10 new projects will again be participating in our program starting in two weeks. But most important, several of these projects have already replicated their model, their work in new geographies with the help of local partners like Sabanshi Foundation in Turkey, 
like World Vision, like the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development, but also thanks to, for instance, partners like the Inter-American Development Bank and Pacto de Productividad in Chile and many more. Several of our program alumni will be presenting later today at 1 p.m. Chile time and also tomorrow at 11.15 Chile time. So I strongly encourage to join you to join these sessions and discover their work and how you can perhaps benefit from their fantastic innovations. I will start with an introduction on today's topic, scaling impact, including some examples. Um, so I will be sharing some slides for this. And then we will hear from Valboga Frölix, practical experience, scaling her model through an innovative social franchise approach. We will open up for your questions after these two presentations, but welcome any comments and questions in the chat at any moment throughout the session. Before we get started with the content, uh, we would like to do a quick experiment and let's see if the technology works. Uh, we would love to know who's in this virtual room, who is with us? So which type of organization you represent? And we have prepared an anonymous, very quick poll for this. I invite you to click on the link, which should be posted now in the chat um, and access Slido. Um, if you don't have the information in the chat, you simply need to use your telephone or your internet browser and type the website slido.com that is s l i d o dot com and enter the access code 421175 so i would uh, ask my, my my friendly supporters in the chat whom i don't see right now to perhaps post this in the chat please slido.com access code 421175 and um, this will lead you to a very quick poll where you can select which type of organization you you represent um, let, me, let me go to that to that poll and see if we already have some results um, so again, slido.com, and you simply enter the numbers 421175 and indicate which type of organization you represent. Let's see if this can work. Thank you. Yes, we're getting the first answers. Thank you very much. So we have some nonprofit organizations, perhaps a couple others who are still filling in the Slido. If Slido is not accessible or working for you, perhaps you can simply post this in the, in the chat, in the Zoom chat as well. Yes, we have public institution representation. Oh, now it's coming, great, thank you. So a bit of a mix between public institution, social enterprises, commercial business, nonprofit organizations. I'll wait another 10 seconds to allow you to use the poll if you wish. All right, great, thank you very much. So good mix of, of actors in the room, thank you. Let me come back to my, to my point. All right, so I, would, I will now start my, my presentation. I will share my screen and um, it will last 15 to 20 minutes, hopefully be inspiring for you. And again, feel free to use the chat to interrupt me or ask any questions now or a bit later. Okay, scale. here we go. Let me see. Uh, there we go. I hope you can see my, my screen and the, and the slides. Um, so the topic is scale your impact. And uh, there's a specific reason also why we specify that it's scaling your impact 
and not necessarily scaling your organization. We will come back to that throughout the presentation. I would like to introduce a couple key concepts when it comes to scaling. I will then provide you some examples and then some very concrete guiding questions that might be useful for you to help you define a replication strategy or consider adapting an existing social innovation. My first message here is that this concept of indirect impact. I'm showing here a slide with two axes. The horizontal axis uh, indicates time. The vertical axis indicates social impact. And we see here two different types of impact which develop over time. The first one is direct impact. So this is the impact you create through your work in your own organization, which of course grows and should be growing. You reach more beneficiaries, you mobilize more resources, um, you launch new programs, new services, new partnerships. This is essential. Now, considering the size of the social issues we face today in our global world, including accessibility inclusion, um, it's probably very difficult for a single organization to really achieve their mission and their dream if they do it alone. So while direct impact and increasing your reach and becoming more professional is absolutely essential, we encourage you to think of indirect impact as well. How can you help other actors in the system to achieve impact? And this graph also shows a so-called tipping point. There's a point in the graph where suddenly the social impact increases much more quickly or exponentially. And this is what indirect impact allows because you empower others and work with others to achieve your vision and your dream. So this is my first message. Direct impact is important, but to achieve the scale of change we need, indirect impact must be considered. Moving on to my next slide. Um, the presentation today will be focusing mainly on what we call replication and transfer. Um, replication transfer is only one approach, one pathway to achieve what we call system change, to achieve your end goal, to influence a system for the better. So if we talk about Inclusive employment, for instance, the system could be considered as inclusive employment, which of course includes many smaller systems uh, in this, um, let's say inclusive employment in Chile. Um, and the idea of system change is not all, is really to understand the root causes as we call them. So the underlying dynamics and the underlying problems behind this specific system and design a strategy to change that in order to fix or improve the system. Um, there are various ways to achieve this. And obviously this is not something that can be done in a day. Of course, direct impact, and as you see in this slide, is important and you can grow, develop, as I was saying previously. Um, but then there are different approaches for more indirect impact. Replication and transfer is one of them, not always the most appropriate that very much depends on your system uh, and on what is needed. Other approaches, which we will not be covering today, are for instance, government adoption. So how can you ensure that your local municipalities or national government or international bodies adopt your innovation and scale it? It's a different model, but can be a very relevant model as well. You can also change legislation, do advocacy, work with others to change the legislation. You can build movements, and we're seeing very exciting movements being built in this field. Um, the Valuable 500, which some of you might know, but also more recently the We the 15 campaign uh, with the International Paralympic Committee, Special Olympics, and many other 
key actors in the field. So movement building, mobilizing citizens and actors in a movement um, and raising your voice is also a relevant approach. Market adoption is the last possibility where you ensure that your innovation is picked up on the commercial market and scaled by companies, for example. But just to frame this discussion, we will be focusing on replication and transfer. Now, sorry, before I go there, I will now be giving three examples which are not active in the field in your sector necessarily. That doesn't matter. I hope these examples will illustrate my previous points and show how they, over several years, decades in some cases, have managed to go beyond direct impact, empower others, and are trying to achieve this system change. The first example is Kaboom. This is an American NGO whose mission is to ensure that all children have the opportunity to play, focusing in the, in the United States. They started 20 years ago building playgrounds in local communities. They were quite successful in doing this. They grew, they mobilized more funding, more resources, and, um, and developed and built mini playgrounds. But after 10, 15 years, they realized that if their system change, their, their end goal is to allow all children to play in the United States, they were never going to be able to achieve this alone. So they open sourced their model. They provided their methodology, their resources, their tools on an open platform and encouraged citizens, companies, and local communities to build playgrounds for children with Kaboom. So instead of Kaboom delivering the service, they started empowering others in an open source model to do this. This was extremely successful and allowed them to build 10 times more playgrounds with local communities and partners. Um, over the last years, and again, thinking back to this system change point, they have added uh, a number of initiatives. They have also created a movement around play, a national coalition with many other partners. They do advocacy. They're trying to influence legislation. They have a label around playful cities, playful shopping, uh, et cetera. Um, so here's one example of an open source approach and a movement approach. My next example is also a very Known one, Aravind eye care system, a very effective and successful medical treatment hospital that started in India and grew organically. They opened new hospitals and grew and had more and more direct impact. But again, they realized they could never achieve their vision alone. And so they created a training facility. And this facility has trained hundreds of other medical practitioners and eye hospitals on the specific Ahavind methodology and principles and model. So this now has allowed Ahavind, of course, to an indirect impact, the train the trainer model, to accelerate the change they want to see with many other actors. So a second example. The third example is Aflatun, which is also a global network of actors who all share the same dream and vision and offer, of offering social and financial education to millions of children and empowering them to make a positive change. Here too, Aflatum started in India, at the beginning piloted different approaches in different geographies, but kept some control in order to learn and to ensure that they really understood what were the specific success factors of their model. And then they opened up through a social franchise approach and started mobilizing and helping many other actors in many other geographies to achieve this mission. The result of which here as well is that they managed in the meanwhile to reach over 14 million children. They work with over 270 partners, 30 governments, and they've created really a global network of partners who share the same vision, 
share some tools, share some methodologies, and share good practices and learnings in a network approach. So key messages here. Um, when you think about scaling impact, try to think even a bit further on system change. Try to aim for system change. How can you understand the system you operate in and what can be done to influence the system deeply with partners? Otherwise, the system, the symptoms, excuse me, will most likely just reappear. Second message is focus on indirect impact. Leverage, leveraging other resources, other partners to achieve your vision is key. And it's often not enough, unfortunately, to scale our own organizations, even though it might be important as well. This requires often to open up and to dare to let go we all, when we create new projects, it's our baby, we're passionate. Um, and it's hard to change perhaps the culture of the organization and the culture of leaders and managers and accept that it's perhaps time to open up, not necessarily open source, but to share your unique expertise, your methodologies, and dare to lose perhaps a bit of control, hoping that partners can help you increase your impact. So in other words, I would encourage us to think from ego system to more echo system. I hope this can be translated in Spanish. It's a bit of a word playing, but going beyond our own organizations, our own egos and partnering and building networks. Finally, because this is a long journey and it's not an easy one, you need to remain flexible and adapt along the way. I will briefly now share with you some of the key strategic questions uh, we encourage projects to consider um, when they start working on a replication strategy. The first key question is, of course, why? Why replicate? What is your goal with this? Is this only, you know, is your founder forcing you to scale and replicate, in which case it might not be the right thing? Or is this something that you intentionally believe fits within your strategy, your capacity, your resources, and what you want to achieve when you scale? Do you want to achieve more impact? Do you want to achieve more revenues? Do you want to become a thought leader, a knowledge expert in the field? What is it that you want to achieve? when replicating. The key point also there is make sure you are ready before you embark on a scaling or replication journey. And I will show some, some elements on that in a minute. Um, the second question is what to replicate? So within everything you do, probably not everything is as easy and as relevant to replicate. So. What is it exactly that you want to replicate? How can you replicate? Where, in which geographies? And very important, which type of partners do you need? I'll quickly go through some of these. Um, I've touched upon the why question briefly, and I was mentioning it's important to make sure it's the right time. If you decide to replicate or scale, make sure you're ready for this. Um, of course, you need to have a proof of impact in your local context before you embark on this journey. So make sure you, your model works, that you have evidence, impact metrics that show that your solution is indeed effective in your local context before you consider replicating it. So proof of impact is one. Two, make sure you have a somehow a sustainable, excuse me just a minute, <clears throat> Apologies. <clears throat> Make sure you have a somehow <clears throat> sustainable business or funding model. So it will be very difficult for you or for partners to adopt your model if there's not some form of sustainable economic or funding model behind it. So that's also very important. Of course, you need a relevant replication strategy. Um, you need a strategy, but it needs to be relevant for other contexts. Not everything 
can be scaled or can be replicated. There must be an identified need for your solution in new geographies, new context. The solution must be somehow transferable to partners, perhaps documented or packaged in a way that you can offer support to your partners. So you need to think about all those points, of course, and ensure that you have the right organizational capacity. So does this really fit within your strategic priorities? Do you have the resources, human resources, but also financial resources to do this? Do you have someone who can really lead this process? Because it's a strategic process and it's not an easy one. So the, here are some of the, the criteria you might want to consider if you're looking into replication readiness. When we look at what to replicate, and I'll just quickly go through these questions and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, of, yes, you can consider to replicate your whole organization with all aspects of it, which is probably not the easiest approach, but might be the relevant one. You might want to replicate a specific activity or a specific program within the range of activities or programs you do. Perhaps it's a specific product or service or a mobile app. But it can also be just principles or values or guidelines, a specific methodology, perhaps. So look at this, ask yourself this question within everything you do. What is it exactly that you think is worth replicating? What is unique? What could partners benefit from? <clears throat> the next question is the how question and this is the beauty perhaps in our field as opposed to the traditional commercial field there are many different interesting approaches and models for replication i am illustrating them here on an axis um, horizontal axis on one hand uh, we will be showing models that um, are more related to direct impact so these are models where you keep a bit more control you are less dependent on partners um some cases a bit a bit slower perhaps and on the other side of the axis models where you lose a bit of control you gain flexibility you are more dependent on partners it might be faster and less costly but there is no best model this very much depends on your reality um, and so well on, on one hand we find um so-called growth models so these are the models where you need to keep control and this might be the right approach at the beginning of a replication strategy where you open, for instance, a new branch, um, a new branch in a new geography, and you keep control over everything. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the so-called dissemination categories where we would find things like open source or train the trainer. So some of the examples we've mentioned where you empower others to deliver your mission with them in a lighter way. These are less formalized relationships. They might not be paying you for this. Um, you might need to accept to lose a bit on quality, but it might be faster and exponential. And in the middle, we have so-called affiliation models, which include licensing, social franchise, partnership certification. So these are models where there is some kind of formal legal and often financial relationship with your partners and you agree on roles responsibilities minimum quality standards uh, etc um, oops apologies for that um the question on where to transfer is um sounds pretty obvious but it's not an easy one to define so here the the, the recommendation is to be very specific and try to define criteria that will help you decide on new geographies and it does not need to be new countries. It can be in your existing setting, of course. Um, so where is this problem most relevant? Where is, could your solution be most relevant? And of course, here you might want to consider language, culture, and other aspects as well. The selection of your partners, so with whom you will work, it's very essential. And this is a crucial part of any replication strategy. Be, be very explicit on the type of partners you need and what roles they should be fulfilling, which expertise, which track record, which resources should they be bringing? And then of course, 
assess them based on these on these criteria. Um, I'll stop here and um, stop sharing my screen as well for now. Um, I hope this was not too long and inspiring. I hope the examples um, gave you some some inspiration and, and, and you got away with some key messages or perhaps some of these key questions can be helpful for you as well. Um, and I'd love to now turn um, if there are no questions yet in the chat. Um, uh, there is a question in the chat. Let, let me take this. Um, I'm reading it live, so bear with me here. Um, if organizations have to prioritize indirect impact and not so much direct impact, how do they know if they are really contributing something and are useful to society? So a question around level of attribution of the impact um, and, and perhaps by extending a bit the question, a question on how do you ensure quality? Um, and this is a very relevant question. Thank you for, for raising it. Um, I think Valborga's testimonial might touch upon this uh, in, a, in a minute as well, because it's certainly um, a challenge that any organization faces when you start replicating and working with partners in, uh, in an indirect way. Um, you need to, I mean, you can, you can let go completely and open source. Um, there are models that really work that way. It's perhaps a bit dangerous if, you work with very vulnerable beneficiaries, for instance, or in other cases where you do need to keep control. So there's a question around control and quality assurance, um, which might push you towards slightly more controlled replication models, still working with partners, but in a way that you can share responsibilities and manage quality. Um, and there's a question indeed on kind of attribution and impact measurement, um, which which is a complex one, is true. There are uh, interesting examples of how some of the examples I mentioned, Aflatum, for example, have set up a global impact measurement and management system with all their partner organizations. Um, but of course, the, your, your actionability, your control, and perhaps the quality of the impact metrics you receive from a network of 250 partners, um, might not be as precise and specific as uh, what you could measure yourself. But this is a trade-off again between gaining the minimum relevant metrics and quality standards while enabling and increasing exponentially your reach and your potential impact. Um, so perhaps we can, hopefully Valboga's testimonial might also add some elements to that. Um, and the point, the, another question here, um, if I can elaborate on the point about leverage is key. Why is it not enough to scale the organization? Sure. So what I was trying to explain there is that um, scaling an organization is, is absolutely um, Im important um, and, and, and is a valuable model as well. But I think there's only so much you can do on your own. Uh, as we know, we are limited by financial resources, human resources, and as great as your organization, your model, your solution might be, the scale of the problems we are facing, whether it's in this field here or in the environmental field or in social equity field, the scale of the problems are so big that I, we don't believe that an organization enough alone can, can really address these problems at the scale they need to be addressed. So at some point we believe leveraging other resources, working with other partners and, and considering this indirect approach um, is complementary and needed um, in addition to the direct approach. So I would just encourage everyone to think about, I think the goal should be scaling the impact, not necessarily scaling the organization. Um, we'll be taking some further questions uh, throughout, so I'll be monitoring the chat uh, and I'll be happy to come back to some of them um, throughout Valbogas testimonial or during the Q&A afterwards as, as well. Um, I would just now like to turn to, to you, Valboga. Um, again, thank you. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have over 20 years experience of, uh, in the field of inclusion and scaling impact. Um, so we really look forward to hearing a bit on your experience, your learning so far. 
Um, and I'd love maybe just to get this started um, to ask you to provide us a bit of an overview on who you are and, and, and what your work is, uh, what Atempo and Capito are, how did it start and what are you doing today? Okay, hello, good, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So, um, yeah, uh, my organization is located in Austria, so it's in Europe, a small country. And um, what we are doing is um, that we try to empower people with disabilities to be able to learn and understand everything. So. This comes from our experience, which we uh, had with people with learning difficulties, so-called learning disabilities, and um, where we experienced that they have no chance to learn and to live um, independently because all the information which is provided around is too complicated and all the education is too fast for them. So um, when um, uh, Loic uh, spoke about leverage or levers, so we decided, we concluded from this situation that one very important lever would be to make information comprehensible, really comprehensible for these people so they, that they can understand and they can use every information which they need. So, and this is the key of Capito. Capito has the goal to make everybody able to write and to provide information comprehensible so that in, as a result, everybody can, underst can understand. Um, and with this goal, um, we, were, we were a really inconvenient organization when we started in the year 2000. Very inconvenient uh, for the government and for the companies with our approach. So they, they were not really amused to hear our idea, to hear from our idea. And now I would say, I can say um, they feel committed. So our kind of service is uh, in, all, in German speaking countries already part of laws when it comes to information from governmental organizations and so on. But, and, and a lot of, of companies, profit companies are clients of us, but our goal is that they not only feel committed, our goal is that they enjoy, that they enjoy to be comprehensible for everybody and that they enjoy to be able to communicate comprehensible. So this is the impact which we want to gather with our job. Thank you, great. And can you give us a bit of an, maybe one or two concrete services or, or products yeah. that you offer or the reach you have already? Yeah, so uh, we started, we started with a service um, and the service is that we, we get um, complicated written information from for example, from a bank or from an insurance company or from a governmental organization. And we simplify this text. We simplify it into different language levels so that everybody can understand this text and uh, give it back to the, gave it back to the, to, to our clients. So this was the first step and we did it manually. Um, second step was that we um, uh, wanted those guys in the governments and in the companies uh, that they learn how to write uh, comprehensible, not only contract us, but do it by themselves. And, and this is a very important service of us, so we train, we train these people. And third goal now is um, to manage the diversity of target groups because every organization, most every organization has the diverse target groups, which means they have people in their target group which are really able to understand everything. Then they have um, part of their target group that doesn't understand, um, only understands really simple information and others like something like common language. 
And this is um, really hard to manage because uh, you have really to, to fit to everybody's need. And this is the reason why we now started with digitization and use digitization potential for the um, dissemination of, of information and also for the production. So what we do is we do the simplification process instead of our uh, clients or for them, or we train them how to do it by themselves, or we support them with digital tools so that they are able to do it by themselves also without training. So this is the range. Fantastic. Yeah, quite a broad, a broad range, but all fitting into this, this concept of easy language. And yeah, and, and I think it's may, maybe it's an answer uh, for this um, former question about direct and indirect impact. So if we only wanted to go for direct impact, we, we would only do our business and uh, simplify text for our clients. And this would be only a drop in the ocean because um, as you said before, so we are limited. We are, we, human resources are limited. And therefore, um, our approach is also to train others. And now the next step is uh, to support people with digital tools so that they can write simple in simple language without any training, only by using the tools. So this is indirect impact, but then our impact can grow only then. Okay. And can you tell us, because I know you started, as you mentioned, in Austria mm -hmm. two years ago, and you've still been growing your direct impact in Austria. But in, in, yep. in, in the meanwhile, you also, as you just mentioned, opted for a more indirect approach and, and in new countries. Can mm -hmm. you explain a bit more which scaling, coming back to the kind of questions I was raising, you know, how did you decide within everything you do, what you wanted to replicate and, and which replication model did you opt for? Yeah. Okay, so I think um, the term replication is a, is a very uh, interesting term for our discussion now, because at the beginning we had we had also a branch in Vienna, and um, for all people um, who do not know Austria, Vienna is the capital town of Austria, and and the city where we are located is only the capital of a province. So and and the reason uh, the result was that the governments in in Vienna didn't like to buy services from us because we are we were not located in the city in the capital city and we had big problems to replicate our method to this branch because now i would say i do not like so much the term replication i like much more the term cooperation and co-creation and this was the reason why we decided to go for social franchising. So we wanted to find partners who are also experts in their field and to uh, develop um, our ideas with them and to, to make the network um, growing up, not only to replicating what we have done and what we uh, thought about our things, but also to, to make it better and to do it in, in co-creation, a lot of, of more things. And I think this is, this, is, um, um, this is a way how to transfer your, your idea which, which fits to us and to us personally. And therefore we decided to take this and also on the structural um, focus, we decided to take a social franchise because we couldn't disseminate our brand and our method open source because we have customers and um, customers have the right to get high quality products and they have the right to get a high quality product um, no matter if it is pro produced in uh, Austria or in Germany or in Switzerland and therefore we need some kind of quality control and this is a big uh, an important part of franchising and therefore franchising was for us a um, professional structure to go in this cooperation to have a quite good balance between control and let it go so that uh, we, we could grow our idea and not had to to scale up our organization because scaling up their own organization is really hard and yeah it's it makes you 
very um, slowly than with partnerships. Well, I understand you opted for the social franchise model because you wanted to keep some form of control um, yeah. and, and opening up completely was not an option. That makes a lot of sense. And because you wanted to be able to rely on partners to professionalize the whole network. Would this tie, there's a question from Juan Pablo, how to address cultural, racial, social, economic yes. differences. Yes. I presume yes. one answer yeah. is to rely on local partners who might have this expertise. Yes. Is this your, yeah. Yeah? yeah. And this is, this is very important. This was very important for us. We looked for partners who are really, um, well uh, implemented in their region and who knows their region and we we identified very clearly what are the key points of our method and then told our partners okay look here these are the key points and around this you um you should and you are invited to change this a little bit uh, how uh, which in, in this way you need for your country, for your culture, for your um, regional um, uh, circumstances and so on. And um, I think this is very important when you are going for franchising or such kind of reputation, you should really know exactly what do you want to replicate and what are the key points for the quality and not try to replicate more than this only this and give the, your partners the freedom to um, yeah to um, to create it um, proper for their region yes i like this message i think that's very crucial indeed um, and it's not an easy exercise no, to look with no. a particular eye on everything you have been developing and decide that this is the minimum basic thing that i will replicate um, it's not yeah. always easy. it's not easy really to identify what what is it so when you do it uh, in your own organization it is not so crucial that you know what is it exactly because yeah people do it and yeah it's, it's a little bit um an organism but when you go for replicating you have really to know what are the key points and otherwise you will fail and i have seen a lot of part of friends failing in this replication process because of this yeah. Can, can you tell us a bit more on, so today you have a network of franchise partners in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, quite a lot. Um, you can tell us a number maybe afterwards to give us an idea of the impact, but how do you manage these relationships? I can imagine that it's your role also changed from delivering yeah, yeah. these services to becoming somehow the coordinator of a large network. How, what, what yeah. does this this is yes i, I think it's a, it's a it's quite good question because um this is true when you are going for upscaling processes you as a founder have to change your role so at, at the beginning you are your product you your product you are your solution and when you are going to replicate you have um yeah you have to be ready that your solution works with out you so that um, not you are the crucial factor so this is the first point and the second is that as you said um i as a person never mm, have to do mm, completely other things than before because so, so i'm of course i am the person who gives the mission and who um who stands for the solution but I'm the person who have to have a look uh, for the network, for the partnership, for the people, for the relationships, for the communication, and has to find out which types of partners do we need, uh, what would be the best role for, for the partners, and how can we um, improve our network and, and our products. Because partners, um, if they found their place, in their region and have their customers and so so then they are satisfied yeah and we as um as the service provider for our partners we have to look okay uh, what will customers uh, need in five years or what can we do to scale up our impact and we have always uh, to look for the next step and sometimes this is uncomfortable for the partners because um, they have to learn next things or they have to, to see okay um, the, 
what I am doing now will not be the same what I will do in, in five, six years. And you have given them um, the pictures and the, and the vision, where is, where is the next step and where is the target so that they go with you? Because you do not have any um, power to swing and also to say to them, you have to, be, to stay with us. Our, every partner can go. So you have to convince them to be partner. And we have 90 at the moment, 90 partners in the network. So nine zero. Yeah, that's very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and perhaps this touches to the question of uh, Carlos early on, on how, I mean, how do you still make sure that you're achieving the impact you want to achieve? Are your franchise partners kind of obliged to report back on certain impact metrics or how, how does that work? Yeah. So oh, um, this is a really good question because um, the, the problem is if you have to have to if you have lots of effort to measure your impact, partners will not do. So partners will not provide um, the figures if they have a big effort to do that. So you, what we did is that we also tried to find out what are um, key indicators for our impact, where can we see it and where can, how can we measure it easily. So, and, and one of our um, uh, indicator is how many people um, use indeed um, the documents which we provide, not uh, how many is distributed, but how many users do, do we have? And we can only count it with our app. So we do not, um, we cannot count all users of our um, uh, information, but we can count these users which uh, use the information via the app and, and via our digital system. And this means that our partners not never have to do anything for measuring the impact because it comes automatically from our system. And we know via this system, we have them so many users. We have 8 million users uh, from coming from this system so that we, we do, we do not need to count also the 25 or 500 or 1000 or 3000, which one partner might have with one brochure. So this is, <laughs> it's, it's only so many and, and this, this helped us. So first to find out the key indicator and then to find a way to measure it without any additional effort because otherwise it wouldn't work with the partners. That's interesting. And I guess that's probably also why digital has become such an important part of your model, yeah. right? And that not only for this, so we firstly tried to use digitalization for, for our partners to make their life easier. So with a really good uh, intranet and, and so that they do not have to, to, mon to uh, make so much documentation and so on. So the, the tools, the tool do it. Yeah. And, and this, this was the first step to support our partners to be more efficient, to be faster, to be better, and to have um, less documentation um, uh, stuff to do. Yeah. And, yeah, that's really interesting. What are, I mean, based on your experience now, if someone in this room is, you know, a bit newer to this field, what would be your your two key advices, what, which type of key learnings or advice would you give to someone who is considering to start a replication journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, in addition to what you have uh, already mentioned so, so well in your presentation, I think I, I would add um, that it is very helpful to ask other people to ask other people who did it or um, to ask professionals and to really to go for advice. So we, um, in our first steps, we, we really, we were bloody, we, we did it and, and we, we had no knowledge about it. And, and I, this I wouldn't do again. So now I, I would go to other people and would, listen to them and, and would go for really professional advice. So it is really helpful because you, you have not to make every 
mistake yeah, <laughs> by yourself. Please. Yeah, so this is one. Um, um, one hint I would give. And uh, the second one um, is um, you should really know what is the business model of your solution, as you mentioned before. Because if you go for replication and and only live from um, fundings or from donations, it would be really hard to for your partners. So you need a business model which works so that your partners can um, establish their uh, your solution in their region otherwise your partners will get um, frustrated and you will you will um, lose them yeah yeah okay fantastic uh, just by the way if if there are more questions please feel free to just put them in the chat as we continue this this conversation for the coming minutes um i'm having a look um maybe what are the what are the next steps or what comes next? And, and are you at all interested in, in, in deploying your activities, for example, in Spanish or in Latin America? Or is this not on the agenda? Oh, of course. Yes, it is. So um, indeed. So uh, the next step is to provide our digital solutions also in English. So in our services, we do in English. So the um, manual simplification we are able to do now. And now we um, develop the digital tools for English. And next, after English, will be Spanish because Spanish is really uh, spoken from many, many, many people. And it's very interesting to us. And um, currently we are um, doing some fact finding in the USA because uh, we are, we think that it would be a good next step to enter the market in the USA. And the um, talks we have up to now are um, promising to do this, yes. That's so these are the next steps, but mm, we focus on the digital um services on the digital tools when we go for in these other countries because for the um, manual simplification we look again and, and search again for experts experts in these regions which really know how how does this region work um how do the people uh, solve these problems up to now and how can we uh, invite them to try our solution and to try this method and how can we go for pilots and so on. So we do it, we will do it again with experts in these countries, in Spanish speaking countries and also in the USA, because we think we are, uh, we do not know these countries and um, it wouldn't be a good idea to go and say, okay, we have one, uh, good thing so and now we have to, we want to replicate it so this is not our approach our approach is cooperation fantastic so to the audience um if you're interested to know more on this solution and potentially help to provide information on on, on the opportunities in your local context um, it will soon be translated and you might be the next one of the next franchise partners in the US or in Latin America uh, would be great. Um, thank you very much, Valboga, for all these insights and sharing your your experience and your learning so far. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back. I'm still watching the, the chat. So if any other questions come in, uh, feel free to post them or we'll try to take them uh, in the remaining uh, minutes we have. I would just like to. Um, mention one more point is that um, I mean here we've been talking a lot about uh, or focusing perhaps our conversation on on um, you know the, the originator as we call it often or uh, the social entrepreneur the organization who has to decide what to replicate how to replicate find the partners etc but there are many roles as you've understood also from Barbuka's testimonial many roles that are needed to develop this replication or co-creation ecosystem um, and, and, and these roles can vary uh, very much like uh, just a second I'll share my, my screen here um, you know as we said you can of course perhaps you have yourself 
an organization and innovation. And you can, of course, can explore how you can replicate or scale your own work. Um, but perhaps you can also implement a proven solution, a proven solution like the one that uh, Valbuga was describing. And there are many others out there that have proven to work, that have been documented, codified, and, and are ready to be replicated. And, and perhaps you can consider to adapt and adopt a proven solution, whether you're an individual, an entrepreneur, or even part of an organization, this might be a way to complement your existing offering and impact. Um, of course, we need funders in this space. Um, it hasn't been mentioned most, but of course, one of the key challenges projects are facing is the, this, what we call often transition to scale. So before you can really start scaling or replicating, there's often a lot that still needs to happen in terms of documenting your methodology, uh, adapting your systems, your process, uh, recruiting partners, uh, searching for partners, market studies. And there's a lack of funding for this tr transition phase. So this is a message to, to the funding side of the ecosystem. We need more of you. We need more of your support and in particular, uh, not only to scale things, but just before to prepare these scaling phases. But we also need people who can connect actors, a broker role, very important. People who can you know, connect Valboga, for instance, with relevant actors and experts in the US or in Latin America. Um, we need people who can give visibility to these proven innovations, promote them. Um, so yeah, dissemination, marketing, platforms. Um, and of course, we need also mentors or advisors or people who know a certain context, a certain model and can provide expertise, challenge, improve these, these ideas. Um, and I would just, before we finish, invite, invite you, if you can, to join again the, the slide or the poll using the same access code and, um, and give us an indication of which type of role you think you could be playing in this in this ecosystem. Um, I need to just give me one second to activate the new um, poll. Apologies. Uh, Loic, there is also a question in the chat. Ah, super. Let's take that as well. Just a second. I'm opening the poll for those who can access it. Um, I'd love to, to see your answers to, to the poll and I'll keep this. Um, on the screen as we as we also take the question then um, I'll just share my screen so everyone sees the the answers to the poll um, so the question is yeah which role could you be playing in this system, ecosystem um, que papel podría desempeñar? Uh, hoping that the translation is is correct give us your your thoughts it would be interesting for us to see um, and as we do that let's let's look into the into the chat, uh, indeed. Um, so a question from Francisca, thank you. What indicators do you recommend for an initiative to be successfully replicated? Um, uh, what indicators do you recommend to measure the successfulness of a replication? Okay. Um, that's a good one. Um, for Boga, feel free to also add your, your points there. Um, but the, if, 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 with this question, you mean the success of the replication once it has taken place? Um, I would say uh, it, it depends, of course, uh, to some extent on your replication model, but uh, definitely are you achieving the impact you initially want to achieve in terms of beneficiaries and the change you want to see with your beneficiaries? Um, are you empowering partners? Are they building capacity? Are they learning? Um, are they bringing back innovation within your network? Are you engaging with the necessary various types of stakeholders um, in your in your approach? Um, I don't know, Valbuga, in your case, do you have perhaps more specific indicators of how you measure your own success in doing this? Um, so, okay. It depends really uh, on the on the upscaling model or on the on the um, replication model. So for us it was that we I have this upscaling always costs money um, at the end. So it costs resources and you have to 
to find. So you, you said before, you have to find uh, these resources or you have to have them. And in, um, in that case, it, what we did is to say, okay, so what is the goal? How many partners do we want to find within the next three years? And how many costs uh, will this be? And, um, and this is a quite good uh, number to measure. So <laughs> if you have your goal, you can measure if you reached it. And you can also measure if the costs you had for this replication process um, comes in a good uh, relation or balance to the output. And the output is not only the number of partners. So the output is, as you mentioned before, the number of users, the number of um, beneficiaries or the number of um, output from the partners. So all these things, if you, if you once know your own impact and know to measure your own impact, you can, um, you have the, the quite good number to measure um, if your replication was successful. I think success is, as you mentioned at the beginning, is not to say, okay, uh, our organization now is bigger than before, or we uh, <laughs> we have more uh, uh, employees, so it, it's good for employees to have uh, work. But but this is not success of impact transfer. So success of impact transfer is is uh, have we um, upscaled the number of users or the number of beneficiaries of our um, solution? And for me. Beside this, um, concerning our model, success is also um, sustainable relationships, sustainable partnerships, because uh, many of our partners are with us from the beginning on, and they are really good partners. And success is also when um, in Austria we have this uh, this uh, phrase when the sum. Uh, when the when it's more than the sum so when the um, i don't know a phrase in english for it but what i mean is when this network of partners is more than only a number of partners so this is really success and this is what we feel and if we feel with our partners so we didn't imagine what now is possible with them so this is much more than only replicating our ideas Thank you very much, Van Gogh, and congratulations on, on, on the work you've, on all these achievements. I, I hope this is of inspiration to the, to the audience. I'm really excited also to see that there's a diversity of people who could be picking up some of the roles we need in this ecosystem. So some of you say we can connect actors, others say we can give visibility and promote these innovations, uh, perhaps be mentors, advisors, implement or, or or replicate. We don't have much funders in the room, right? That's always a bit of an issue. Or, or we do, but they don't. Maybe it's diff more difficult for them to, to admit it, uh, just managing expectations for them as well. Um, we're reaching the end of this, of this session. I hope this has been inspiring, interesting. Um, I'm happy to share uh, some of the slides uh, afterwards, if, if some of you would be interested in that. And um, uh, thank you, Varboga, in particular, for being with us and sharing all your, your experience and insights. Um, I wish all of you a very inspiring conference. I, again, encourage you to join um, the session a bit later today. I think at 1 p.m. there's a session on ICT for Inclusion, which is a, a program in Chile, which is specifically trying to, among other things, uh, it's a very broad program, but part of this program is to uh, replicate three solutions in Chile with local partners in Chile. So they will be sharing a bit more from their work there. That would be very exciting. And then tomorrow at 11.15, I think, um, five alumni of our impact transfer program will be pitching, so presenting their solution uh, and their replication strategy uh, and how you as partners could perhaps support them or benefit from these solutions. So. Wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you again uh, for this opportunity and um, stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Thank <laughs> you.